Hi, everyone. Arlene here. Welcome to Beacons of Balance. This is my beautiful co-host, Joanne, and our Hi, wonderful everybody. guest speaker, Larry, Larry Garrett, but we'll introduce him shortly. I'd like to welcome everyone here. If your first time coming in, thank you for being here. Beacons of Balance is about living in balance. We live in a world of duality, up, down, left, right. And when we're like this, we're out of sync. So we're here. We bring on wonderful guest speakers with their pearls of wisdom. And it's about you to help you to come here. Right. So thank you so much ahead of time. Wow. Where do I start? I mean, we really need like two hours just to go through the bio. It's yeah. How do, you, how do you know Larry? You know, Larry, we were just talking about that this morning. I kind of swore I met you at Mid-America Hypnosis Conference because I went to every conference. This is when you were speaking all the time. You were, oh my God. And I was always like, oh my God, this guy is so good. He's so good. But then you came over to my house with Jack and you brought a couple of hypnotherapists with you and we had some fun that day. Um, so yeah, we've known each other. I, I feel like we're just kindred spirits there, you know, but oh, gosh, where do I start? You've got over 50, you said 54 years of practice. You started in what, 1970. You, you owned one of the largest, oldest, coolest hypnosis centers in all of Chicago land. And you've incorporated electronic uh, hypnosis in 74. Uh, mm -hmm. my, you work with the police department, you know, to solve. You worked with physicians in the hospitals. But the coolest thing, we want to get into this, Arlene, because you're going to love this. In 2001, uh, Larry went to Baghdad by invite to work on Saddam Hussein's son. I'm like, I just get the Holy God, I got, I got the wave on that one. <laughs> oh, then he wrote this book about it. You know, it's like, oh. whoa. I'm telling you, guys. Buckle up your seatbelts. What we, year was that? It was 2001, right? Wow. Yeah. And then not to mention you taught in over 400 colleges. That alone in 30 states, that blows my mind. You, you've you been on 100 plus radio, TV. How many articles have you written? Probably millions of them. So, wow. wow. Welcome, Larry. So Later. excited about this one. Do you feel the energy, Arlene? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're blowing it. We're just gonna we're, we're just, gonna blow this. Hey, hey, folks out there, we may just disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so, Larry, wow, you've been in business fifty plus years. I mean, that's something. I had my business for ten years, and that was, you know, was something too. But um, so, hypnosis. Are there some people that can't get hypnotized? I happen to be one of those, and I've tried. I've been, you know, I'm open, and for some reason. When I've sat, I, I was with someone and he worked on me for like an hour. And at the end of it, he said, congratulations. He said, you're the first person, you know, go down the hallway and see the door. What do you see? And I said, gray, gray, open the door. What do you see? Gray. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm an ET and I'm just in the gray. <laughs> so are there some people, um, and I know you could say, you know, the person's blocked or, or whatever, but I, yeah, you know, I was open to it. I wanted it. You know, good morning or afternoon, whoever is when we're watching this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> well, maybe it's evening. Excuse me. Maybe uh maybe we might view hypnosis a little different, partly, and then we don't say, Can I be hypnotized or can I be hypnotized? To me, hypnosis is like art. Some people like oil, some people like watercolor, some people like pastel, some people like sculptures. Their issue is that hypnosis is different for every individual. So this person that hypnotized you, he says, you're walking down a hallway and and uh, you're getting to a door and what do you see? Great. Well, maybe, maybe he or she needed to use a different technique for you because maybe you didn't like oil colors. Maybe you like watercolors. So I might have chose to, chosen a different technique because of, uh, you know, when I say 54 years, I actually started in my training in 1968. I was about 12 years old, and not, I'm just joking. <laughs> and uh, you were you were just fetus. You were fetus. Yeah. <laughs> well, in 1970 is when I started a, a practice, thanks to my mom. My mom says, "You want to do hypnosis? Quit your job and do hypnosis." I, it was not an easy thing, but I trusted. And I'm going to say, over those years, I've learned a great skill. And that is what doesn't work. If you uh, learn a skill of what doesn't work, then you could learn what can work. So I think about the different mentors in my life. And before hypnosis, I used to reweave uh, Oriental rugs, you know, and 
in the sixties, Oriental rugs were a big thing. And if you had a cigarette burn on a twenty thousand dollar carrot stand, ooh, you needed a fix. Well, I was only in about twenty, and I had this mentor. His name was Bob Dyson, and and I was always in a hurry, and I'd say, Bob, I screwed it up, and he'd sing. Do it slow, do it right, do it fast, do it twice. So I've learned that <laughs> when there's an error. Yep, I like that. Me too. Yeah, that's great. Stay with me too. You take a note from me. Another phrase that said, it's not how good you are, it's how good you fix your mistakes. And I think I... that's another good philosophy for me to say, when I meet an Arlene and I spend an hour and she can't be hypnotized, first of all, I would know in the first five minutes. The first five minutes would give me indications like this. So you close your eyes you do this. Oh, sorry, I hit my table. You do this. Then you do this. Then you open your eyes, say, is it working? Then you close your eyes. Then I know right away that this is, we're going to have a little challenge. So That's the issue you get the club. You get the club and you hit it. You know, I have, a, I have a great book. I have a great book my mom gave me as a gift in 70. Oh, and it was a book on the Encyclopedia of Stage Hypnosis. And in the 70s, there wasn't much call for people to remove anxiety or sleep better or quit smoking, but you could make a few dollars during hypnosis shows. And excuse me, and this book in there said that if the person doesn't respond, hold their juggler veins until they pass out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, never, I need. That's what I, I never need. did that, but you know, you're joking say hit up the head. But Arlene, to answer your question with more seriousness, because you notice I'm kind of a light person. I like that one. Uh -huh. You're in the right camp here. Good. <laughs> Good. I had a client crazy. last night who said, I'd like to go to Disneyland because it makes me feel like a kid. I said, I feel like a kid all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, like Joanne, I'm a Pisces. Pisces never grow up to all these kids. Yeah, we are children we are. all the time. But anyway, to answer your question with seriousness, I think everybody could be hypnotized if they understand what this means. And it's nothing more than an altered state. It's that feeling when you're driving along. It's, oh, that was my exit. That's hypnosis. It's when you take. Take the logic and distract it. Hypnosis is to the mind what magic is to the vision. The, hip, the magician says, watch this trick. As he or she holds up their hand, they pull a string with the other hand. Hypnotists say, relax your legs as you no longer have this anxiety. So it has nothing to do with the anxiety, but as your logical mind is focusing on your legs, they can kind of sneak in the positive suggestion. So hypnosis can work. I'll make a recording and send it off to you, or when I come to Connecticut, I'll. Are you going to come to Connecticut? Oh, she's well, going to hold you to it. I'll be, in, I'll be in New Hampshire and Massachusetts in August. Really? Here yeah. you go. What part of Massachusetts? And I'm going to be uh, in um, Marlboro. Oh, okay. About 40 miles from Boston, and there's a hypnosis conference I go to every year for about the last 35 years. The National Guild of Hypnotists. Oh, and yeah. Should I come and be a guinea pig? You can. <laughs> you can put me up on stage. This is a challenge. Well, one. one day we'll meet on Zoom. I'll hypnotize you on Zoom. How's that? Oh, boy. Oh, Lord. It will. That's oh. a lot of pressure. I'd be too that. <laughs> now we know why the guy couldn't hypnotize her. See? I, he's just doing this. Yeah. A lot what of pressure. What am I doing? I did. <laughs> Just by you saying it, I can't. You're not going to hypnotize me. Like, oh no, no. Yeah, maybe we need to take care of your editor so we can do what we need to do without rushing. Yeah. <laughs> so, Larry, we we have to get into this most intriguing. Tell me. That, uh, it's like, and you know where I'm going with this. Uh, it's shot. We need to hear the we need to hear the real story. <laughs> okay. About Baghdad and how in God's name did you get invited to that? That's what I want to know. How does that happen? Isn't, no that a great, there. isn't that a great thought? You know, uh, you know, Joanne and I have spoken over the years, and we both have a common belief of spirituality. And I think spiritually speaking, I don't know many other people who would have been okay going to Baghdad. I was invited to go to Baghdad by the Saddam Hussein family. And by the way, I, I like to ask everybody, where were you in 9-11? Because as you notice in my book, it says that. Where were you? I was in Baghdad watching TV with Uday Hussein on 9 11. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, so, oh, uh, my Lord. Uh, so there's two, the fa two factors. One is I'm going to Baghdad. I have a friend, my friend Barb, who was a uh, travel agent. 
And they says, tell me, when I go to Baghdad, where should I stay? You can't go to Baghdad. People don't go to Baghdad. Mm -hmm. So there was a restriction of anybody traveling to Baghdad from the United States from 1991 to 2001. And I was one of the first people, Americans, to go to Baghdad in those years. And I was also the only American that was ever invited by the Saddam Hussein family to come to Baghdad, meaning I didn't go there on my own. They invited me. So that was a story. And wow. 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 Oops. So then tell us what happened. How did you get to work on his son? Well, his son had been shot, but I wasn't told. When I when I was initially invited, I wasn't told it was Uday Hussein. I yeah. met with a neurosurgeon here in Chicago who was from Baghdad, and that was the son's surgeon. And he said to me that his patient had had a serious car accident, and he had difficulty in walking, but his medical staff determined it was in his mind. What? So he would like to know if I'd come to Baghdad and hypnotize him to walk. So I said, well, let me think about it, because really I'm kind of cool, you know, I don't say, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I would have, I wanted to. So then after that, I said, I'll get back to you. As I started telling family and friends, you can't do it, they'll kill you, you'll never come home. And uh, so I, I write about that in that book, if you might have read that, you know, everybody was saying, don't go. But I, I do trust, and I do live my heart and my soul by feeling that if it's okay, it's okay. No, and like Joanne with her very powerful readings. She just has a feeling inside, gives a reading, and it comes out. She does her art, and it comes out. Look at her art behind you. Look at that beautiful art there. And, uh, so, That's Raphael. You know, yeah. Nothing. And so when I was asked to go to Baghdad, it was exciting. But here, let me share, Arlene, and Joanne also. I don't watch the news. I haven't watched the news probably in 20 yeah. years or better. You say, well, how do you know what's going on if you don't watch the news? What's well, the clients always say to me? And I point at them and I say, you'll tell. <laughs> so, Larry, so I'm on the page with you. When I had my shop, it's the same thing. I never had time and I never watched. And they said, what's wrong with you? I said, listen, if it's something major, you'll I'll tell be here yeah. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> jo Joanne told me about a tornado in Texas. I, I, I don't want to sound naive, but I didn't know they had a tornado. I did. Larry. Okay, see, see, we're gonna get along. We're doing well. Joanne just knows because it was a personal hey, option. Ask you. Issue. I did it. I did it. The only reason I knew is because it affected me personally. And it's yeah, not because right. I'm. That's not because I'm dissing it or anything. My heart goes out. I mean, it's yeah, horrible. Me too. Just, me too. Yeah. Me too. I read. I read the news. Though. I read every day. I every morning I wake up and I start reading online, especially, and it tells me a lot. But I get some good emails. You ever received an email called Good News? Good news. That's a good one. That's a good one. She always has some great stuff about what's going on in the world on a positive level. But I huh. do. I read that. So going to Baghdad, getting back to that, I I didn't know it was a dangerous place to go, but I didn't feel it was going to be dangerous. I remember one of my greatest conversations with Uday Hussein was he used to call me Mr. Larry. And he'd say, Mr. Larry, he spoke with an accent, but he spoke good English. He said, I have a question. I yes. How come you're not scared to be here? And I oh. just smiled. I said, if I invited you to my home, would you be scared? And he just laughed. That's true. I mean, if somebody invites, somebody invites you to their home, why should you be scared? Yeah. By the way, that book, Joanne, that you were just holding up has been republished in Japan. I will yes. hold it. How about this one? Yeah. Can you can you read this? Can you read this one? This one's a good one. Read that. Oh yeah, you uh, yeah. Look, look I know that's exactly blue. what that said. I know exactly what that said. exactly what that. <laughs> that was so, another lifetime writer, Arlene. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, then it was republished. If you ever if you ever write a book, void publishers. This one was published by a publisher. Oh my lord! Oh yeah, geez. it's a little different story, oh. and uh, and it cost me a lot of money to get my name back. That's history, and uh, so the idea is that. Uh, the story about Baghdad is that it was a wonderful experience. Wonderful. I was there twice. I was there in April 2000, and I was there in, well, yeah, 2000, 2001. April 2001 on Mother's Day. I remember calling my mother, and it was a bad phone connection. She said, where are you? I said, I'm in Baghdad. I told you not to go there. Well, too late, Mom. I'm here now. Happy Mother's Day. That was in April. And then they invited me back in August. 
Well, yeah. um, because, you know, like the FBI said to me, I was interrogated by the FBI I many was times. Say, I was going to say, yeah. didn't the states pull you in and say, like, first of all, who are you? What the hell are you doing there? <laughs> yeah, really? Right. Hypnosis? Yeah. yeah, really? Come on. They, I, had, I had to get permission were, from were them. You, were you strip searched? I'm sure you were strip No, no. In no? fact, if I, if I showed you my... Uh, Oh my, my passport. My passport had a separate piece of paper for the visa to go to Iraq, because the FBI said you don't want to have them stamp it in your passport, because when you come back into the United States, our own people will give you a hard time. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, of course. Yeah, right so I was interrogated by the CIA and the FBI, and that's another funny story. We could spend hours on that one, but best to just I'll send you a book, Arlene. You you send me. We we have to have you come back every month. I know. This going to be on. So much fun. Here's so much fun. Uh, fun. You know, one of the things that I like about myself is that I am not the norm. I was raised by a single mom. She gave me some great advice. Yeah. <laughs> not the norm. <laughs> and uh, so I, I like to take a risk. And going to Baghdad was not because I was taking a risk. I was invited. But who has an opportunity to go to Babylon? You know what? I could talk to you about an hour just walking through Babylon, the huh. oldest culture in the world where language started. The language, I, yes. yes. Did you ever feel that when you were there? Oh, like yes. Energy yes. That... Oh, we're, walking, we're walking along the streets of Babylon, and we had a tour guy spoke with a heavy accent, and he says, notice what you are standing on. Huh? He says, that's asphalt. Yeah. 3,000 years old. Whoa, and no potholes? No potholes. <laughs> and you know how to do it better. They do no. that. So, so it was very exciting. You know, and if you read the history of Babylon, you know, they took a river. I can't remember. I think it was three, 4,000 years ago, maybe 1,500. I can't remember numbers. The Pisces and me. And they moved this river 15 miles away because it was in, it was flooding Babylon. You know, if you look at Babylon, I've got photos of Babylon and there's, Little windows like at the ground level. They used to be below. Babylon's built on three cities on top of each other. Very, wow. very spiritual, very mystical. Wow. Okay, I tell you what. You want some out of No. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Did you happen to meet the father? No, you know, Listen I'm often asked that question, but I'm sure he was watching me. If oh, I, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. You know. You have I'm a sure. you have a son. Do you have a son or a daughter, Arlene? Yes, both. One hey, of each. Joanne does. Okay. So if your son was being met by this foreigner, wouldn't you want to be checking him out? I yeah. Would. No, I didn't meet him personally. Though no. I met his brother, though. Uh, you know, now I'm going to leave your your viewers with a very profound statement. During the Iraqi War, which, by the way, really upset me because these were my friends now. This was what I had seen. Mm -hmm. This is beauty. I mean, when you walk through a city that's, buildings are a thousand years old, uh, you, uh, uh, when you walk through a city that's buildings are a thousand years old, you have to feel this energy. So now I see it being bound. And you asked about uh, his father and I met his brother. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the story said that Uday and his brother were, killed in this building in Mausel with his 12-year-old son of the brother. Well, first off, Uday was saying, I got to know him well. We spent every day, 10 days, two different times. That's 20 days we spent hours together. So I got to know this man well. I mean, I would just sit there and I would learn about who is this man. The whole world hated him, by the way. Everybody hated him. He was if you ever see the movie, The Devil's Double, it's a terrible story about how bad he was. But, you know, everybody who's bad has good in them. I've hypnotized murderers before. I've hypnotized people who've done serious crimes before. As Joanne mentioned in that introduction, I used to work with the police departments on this. And, and I learned even a murderer has a reason for what they do. But going back to Uday and Kuse, his brother, and Kusei's 12-year-old son, when the war started, they were in a building unprotected, and Uday never had less than six or seven guards around him with guns in their hands all the time. 
So why was Uday and Kuse in an unprotected building 60 miles away from their home with a 12-year-old boy when they got killed? Knowing Uday and Kuse, Kuse I didn't get to know well, but I've met them a few times, they didn't like each other because they were both vying for leadership. Uday was in line for leadership because he was oldest, but because he walked with a limp, he said to me one day, he says, this is a very macho country, and I would not look good as a leader if I walked with a cane and a limp, which was sort of true. That's why I was there. So here's Kuse and Uday, who don't like each other, had not spoken or sp uh, spent time together in the last couple of years, and a 12-year-old boy being shot by the Americans. So part of me leaves that as you think, why would they be together during a war without protection? Why didn't they just run away? Why didn't they go to Syria or something? So you wonder if Uday's still alive. Just leave you to ponder on that. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So Arlene, Very interesting. Arlene's thinking about that one. Maybe you're right. Well, that's an interesting fact because when 9-11 happened, <laughs> yeah. I'm not laughing about it because it's worse. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, I, I, my, see, my mind is a little warped. I'm thinking how many people that escaped really got out of there? Say either men or women that were going through a bad divorce, Reward. and they thought, "Aha, mm -hmm. this is my way out." This they is my way out. They could live left and went off into the great beyond, and everybody thinks they're dead, but they're really not. Well, they had a lot of money, so they could have done that. They wouldn't have to go through the yeah. divorce process. You I know, when you that's like, where my my crazy yeah. mind goes. <laughs> yeah, and my my thoughts are is that they ran away because already they had this history of being hated. If I were hated by my community, if I were hated, I live in Chicago proper between Airfield and downtown. And if I were hated by my community, I probably wouldn't go out of the house much. Do you think? Right. Uday right. never well, left his know, house without guards. Isn't that a horrible life though? Because really what is it? You're living in fear. I mean, horrible. it's all fear-based. Not You're not living at that point. No, you're not living. You're just existing. No. You're right. existing. Yes. Yeah, this or, is this is going to be a great podcast. Can you tell? Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is our star. <laughs> I mean, this will be the yeah. star yeah. production. Yeah, <laughs> we can talk production. about this one episode, you know, yeah. for another three hours. You can advertise this one: the crazy man who went to Baghdad on nine eleven. On nine eleven. Wow. Yeah. I mean, wow. That. Wow. Yeah. You know, there's another one, Joanne, if you read the book about the Amaria bomb shelter, look that one up, Arlene, on Google. Armaria, Armaria, in fact, if you go on YouTube and you look on Larry Garrett, I've got a video about that one. The Amaria bomb shelter is where 400 women and children were in this bomb shelter, and the Americans bombed it, claiming that they thought it was an artillery base and killed all these people, and the horrific energies inside was with one of these bombs that just explode inside and you see oh, bodies, yeah. images on the walls and hands up on the ceiling. And uh, I have a video of it on YouTube if you have an interest in looking at it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> wow. And Marlene, you wanted to uh, talk or you wanted to ask him about the past life regressions because we always we always oh. found that so interesting. And past life yes, I'm fascinated. I know um, just alone you did 500 um, past lives and um, so what were the ones that kind of stood out to you? Any, like a significant Little. one when you did it? One of the first ones that stood out, one of the first, what, what stood out to me is one of the first times I was a student in my instructor, Fred Schauble's class as a hypnotist trainee, and some visitors came and one of the visitors wanted to be regressed and I had never regressed somebody. And my instructor, he had, he had good faith in me, said, Go by Larry. He's an expert in regressions. I knew nothing, but I had watched him. So, okay, close your eyes. So I'm hypnotizing this man who later I was in a documentary called Present Dreams, Past Lives. And in a documentary, we used this man. His name was Larry Goodwin. And Larry gets hypnotized. And I said, where are you? Monroe, Louisiana. And he had this heavy Southern accent. And all of a sudden, he's telling me he's in Monroe, Louisiana. Well, at that time, I was in a different stage of life. I was married at that time, and so my wife and family and I decided we're going to go to Monroe, Louisiana, and do this research. So when you ask about the most exciting one, that was a pretty exciting one. 
And I had another one that was also on this uh, documentary we did, and it was a man, excuse me, who spoke three languages while he was hypnotized, Greek and ancient Latin. We had a priest on this documentary and said, that's an ancient Latin, that's not a common Latin. And this man claimed he was at the crucifixion of Christ. So that was a pretty exciting one. Yes. Yeah, that would be us early. (laughs) And so when you ask me what's the most exciting one, I want to share with the both of you, all of them are exciting. All of them, yeah. When you rest somebody, feel yourself traveling with them. There's a book that I read in the 70s, and it's called Time and Time Again. Hmm. And it's about a man, this is a fiction, but it's a good story, about a man who's hired by our government to learn self-hypnosis and hypnotize himself and go back in time and retrieve a letter from 1904 that they didn't want this letter to go on. <laughs> and when I read that, it was right, right around the time I'm getting involved in hypnosis. Whoa! So my my energy started going into past lives. Today, you know, today at my time in life, time is valuable. It's so valuable, one hour spending with you or the amount of time we spend. It's so yeah. valuable to walk my dog Jack in a little while. These are the things that are valuable. So regression usually takes about three, four hours. You can't start regressing to a person and saying, where are you at? I'm in my home. What's your home look like? It's a log cabin. Where do you live? In a farm. You don't want to say, okay, let's stop. So you want to keep <laughs> going, right? And some, some, like myself, I've been through many lives in my life. I, most of my lives, I was a woman in another life. And uh, one of my lives that was most significant to me when I was regressed was uh, something maybe 2,000 years ago or so. And I was a very tall, thin man with a beard and the long hair, and I was wearing a brown robe, and I had sandals on. And I could remember a scene when I was a young boy, and I was sitting on the ground in sort of like a classroom. And I could pick up the sand on the ground, and the sand would run through my fingers. So I was probably in the Middle East, maybe that's why I went to Iraq. Yeah. But that class, I mean, excuse me, that regression, this is before I got into hypnosis as a profession, it stimulated me to start teaching hypnosis to start teaching others, because that person was a teacher, and he was teaching people life. And I don't know what that was about, because in regressions, it's like a dream. You know, it's like vague, but you could be detailed as well. So you ask, what's the most exciting regression? I like that first one, Larry Goodwin, because we did research. Everything he spoke of was in Monroe, Louisiana, except for one street. I remember going to the library and doing some research in Monroe, Louisiana, and that one street's name was changed in the 1930s. So in other words, he was accurate on everything. And then he spoke about City Cemetery. And I remember asking a neighbor, a friend there, first I met, where's City Cemetery? I don't know. I said, we have old City Cemetery on the outskirts of town. That's it. And everything he he described was in that cemetery. Wow. That's amazing. That was pretty exciting. Is it right or wrong? I have a thought about it, regressions. It could be a story I've heard. It could be a dream I had. It could be my imagination. And it could be real. Who am I to question what I don't know? Yeah. Remember wow. I, asked, I asked earlier, who are you? I have another question or comment. Think of all the things that we know. Collectively, the three of us put our, our consciousness together. Now mm-hmm. think about what we don't know. Ooh. Well, they say you only use one very small part of your brain, right? So no, you're not well, even called consciousness, just our brain, our consciousness. It's kind of shut off just when we get when we get when we come in here. <laughs> and then think of all the trillions of beliefs you come in yeah. here, right? Beliefs. See, I believe the subconscious mind is a hundred times stronger than the logical mind. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. What I know, what I know is not what I feel, but what I feel is what runs my life. Right. I mean, yep. You think of all those lifetimes that we've had and all those beliefs. It just blows my mind that we're carrying it. We come in here with trillions of beliefs and it dictates Indeed. how you are today as a, you know, I have just right. two quick, quick things I want to hit uh, if we could. I mean, Please, I, go I ahead. if it goes over. Um, the, uh, is it electronic hypnosis that, what is that? Well, well they're a good example. People, <laughs> 
No, that you know, it, not it's, going under. You know, I don't know why. It's, I don't know why the term was put as electronic, but because you lose lose elect, you use electronics. In nineteen seventy three or four, I had the great gift of being trained by a very well known physician who used hypnosis, and his style of hypnosis at that time was to wear headphones. I'd speak through a microphone, so I would take this microphone and I'd talk to you through the microphone. I was going to grab a microphone to show you, but it doesn't matter. And I'd talk to you, and you'd hear me through your headphones, because now if a siren goes by, I could turn the volume off and you don't hear me. Uh, if a door slams, I could turn the siren, oh, siren down, the volume down, you don't hear me. So electronic hypnosis is just like regular hypnosis. The difference is you're isolated with headphones. You're using instrumentation. That's right. That's right. And, okay, and got it. Okay. Many professionals do. Yes. Well, I mean, one other question. I'm, I'm sorry, sure. Joanne. I'm cutting. I, I don't mean to. Because she always tells me I talk too much. Um, when you do regressions, one, if you could just answer this, a lot of times people are regressing. They said, like you said, they were during the time of Christ, or so. How come, like, say, Joanne's regressed and I'm regressing? We both are. We have a life, and we're both Joan of Arc. How could that be? Yeah. Then you know. <laughs> Many years ago, that's a great question, because many years ago, there used to be a story all the time, everybody can't be Cleopatra. Yeah, exactly. but yeah, but people come back and no. go, oh, I was but I would hypnotize, I would hypnotize people, and they would tell me they were Cleopatra, or they were Joan of Arc. Uh, right. I think the imagination, when you are hypnotized, use this example. It's like an altered state. It's like the friend I spoke of that was always high. It's an altered state where the logic is minimized, because as a good regression, I have some great manuals, by the way, on regression and other factors that uh, if anybody has an interest, I could send them to them and just as a gift. And the one on regression speaks about the best way to regress a person is stimulate their senses along the way. See, if you were regressed or hypnotized, Arlene, and you just were told to walk down a hallway, there's no hallway. How could I walk down a hallway? But if we could create in your imagination the sensations we speak of, then you'll regret regress. If you excuse me, if you become Cleopatra or Joan of Arc, mo most likely you're letting your hallucinations get away with you. I think that many of us could go back to ancient Egypt and be in ancient Egypt and be in describe it. But I think that as you get into ancient Egypt, if the hypnotist isn't selective in his or her choice of words, then the imagination will get carried away and you say, Well, who are you? Joan of Arc. <laughs> See, so it's just, to me, it's just the imagination getting carried away. It doesn't mean they're lying because in their irrational mind, they believe it. I always said, one of these days, I'm going to get all the John of Baptist, all the Jesuses, all the Mary Magdalene. Uh, Mary Magdalene, but in the ballroom, I'm like, oh, duke it out. Just duke it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's me. It's I me. Think, I, think, I think everyone. Everyone needs to experience a regression at least once. Yeah. And the reason is because we could use our imagination of what it is, is but until you experience, you know, there's a great. Uh, I used it just recently. Uh, I did you see my latest, uh, my latest pod or my podcast? I do these little five minute videos, Arlene, on YouTube. I love that one. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did one the other day about can our can our. Uh, system talk to each other can our immune system talk to the heart did yeah. you ever see that one that was a good yeah. one excellent yeah, a, thank you i like that one too excuse That's the ego it's not it's not arrogance when it's true but i really like that one because I'm, i believe that there's a consciousness far beyond yeah. our yeah. yeah right and i think That's everybody an important talk. factor to talk i was just talking to joanne about we're going to do a, a, um, an episode on with body talk yes yes talk body talk body. Good. i so always when, thank when my a, heart because if it's beating constantly, never takes a vacation, you know, so. When a person has a challenge with their kidneys, there's probably communication going on with all of the other organs as well, you know? So going back to regressions, and I suggest everyone try one. I may have mentioned this one in that talk. Uh, in 1955, I think it was, before I remember, there was a commercial for Oldsmobile. And the commercial showed a person standing next to his car and he's holding the fender and it says, ask the person who drives one. I thought that was one of the greatest commercials because it didn't say our car's better. It just says, ask the person. So if you want to be, re if you want to know about regressions, 
then be regressed, and then you'll know about regressions. Exactly. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Well, is there anything you want to share about your healing center? What services you offer, Larry? <clears throat> well, yeah. <laughs> we do have a very, uh, we have a beautiful place, Arlene, that someday if you're in Chicago, it's about 4,000. I'm going to come. I'm coming to Illinois. Yes. Yeah. We're coming. Joanne and I are going to come see you. Okay. I want, yeah. yeah. Nay, all day. Yeah. You know, and I manifest continually. Friends of mine call me the master of manifestation because I create things continually. Yeah. So I used to be over a, on a, a different area of Chicago for my hypnosis practice for about 25 years. Okay. And I rented. And the neighborhood I live in was going through some changes, but I have this visual image of what might happen in the future. So I used to walk past this neighborhood bar all the time in Chicago. Chicago has a lot of neighborhood bars, and they lost their license and they were closed for five years. Every time I'd walk past that bar, I'd say, you know, that would make a nice wellness no. center. And one day there was a woman out in front picking up litter and she said, she didn't speak English well. And she said, Mr. Mr. Come here. Yes. You want to buy my building? Yeah. <laughs> and so she offered me a price cheaper than if you bought the bricks and it was dilapidated. The building was just yeah. falling up. But it's a beautiful building. It's triangular shape. If you go on my website, you'll see Ooh, a it's gorgeous. It. It's three sided. It, How it's cool. A, it was yeah. ugly when I bought it. Really yeah. ugly. But uh, in the, on my website, you'll see interior photos as well. And the issue is it's about 4,000 square feet. We have five hypnotists. We have massage. We have rocking. We have Reiki. We have acupuncture. We have yoga. So it's an alternative wellness. Amazing. And a student of mine many years ago said, if you had five hypnosis centers on one block, everybody would know where to go for hypnosis. I bet when you had your bookstore, that was true, Arlene. You have other bookstores, people would know where to go for a bookstore, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, actually, it wasn't just a book. Well, I had, well, back then, there weren't many books on angels and that. And you had probably like five of them. But it was yeah. a holistic healing center I started. It was okay. an angel. It was Same angels. Thing. It was angels, an angel shop. Oh. But I also had, like you have, practitioners. Yes. Psychotherapists, massage therapists. Yes. Good. Yes. It was Good. wonderful. I loved it. That's what we have. Oh, we have alternative yeah. wellness. But, uh, you know, Joanne said, you know, mention it. So I mentioned it, and uh, it's called the Garrett Wellness Center. Right. And uh, to me, it's a very special place. It's very spiritual. When you walk in, the feng shui is incredible because you walk in the pinnacle of the beginning of the triangle, and out it spreads in all directions. That's, that's wonderful. You know, when you create a place from the heart, like mm -hmm. I was guided to create angels and Joanne's guided with her. You know, we're all guided. We listen. Yeah, we are. You know, thankfully, the three of us, we listen. People wow. feel it. They I do. have so many people that walk through the door and they would comment. They would yeah. cry. They would cry because they were getting it. And of course, I was writing always to my angels and they said, people will come in and leave differently. And I thought, you know, you think it's, and I thought, oh, I'm crazy. You know, what am I crazy thinking this? And they said, they're going to leave different because their hearts are going to be touched. Yeah. yeah. And they were. Yeah. You've got to put the love into whatever you create. I want to thank, the, I wanna thank the two of you for knowing you and being in my life because, you know, what's that saying that they say, you know, God said Christ, whatever. if you touch one soul, I'm going to cry. If you touch one soul in this life, it's yeah. magnificent. Wonderful. So right. just, just think of who's being touched, you know? The think about that who, little ripple think of, that goes out. Think about who's watching this podcast and maybe we're touching their soul. Exactly. We're touching each other. And that's what it's all about. And it's like, about you know, people are going to go, ah, hearing your story about Baghdad, it's like, Oh, how could he go there? And those people are evil. I think, you know, in the core of us, we all have what we want. We want our families. We want love. We want peace. We want harm. We want all that. But then that other, I call it the other caca, yeah. comes in and tries to infiltrate. Yeah, as Joanne just showed when she showed the book, that book is about love, by the way, Arlene. It's not a, about love. Uday. No, it's all about love of the community of Baghdad. They treated me like royalty. I'm not talking about the Uday family. I'm talking about the residents. The people. The people. People. Every time I'd walk by a person, they'd go like this, and I said, what's that? That's respecting respect. the visitor. It's exactly. like, it's reverence. Yeah. I always say, 
who was it? Oh God, um, I can't think of the author now. He said, rather than having the word respect, he said, have reverence. Reverence. That's the difference right. with the our, you know, respect, you think you're owed something. You, right. know, you should yeah. respect me because I'm this. Reverence, we're seeing the light in each other. And we well, yeah. and namaste means I honor the yes. God. The light. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh my God! I think I think I like a word of respect is to allow, trust and allow. And I want to share if you and the, if the three of us spend some time together, we would open our consciousness to extremes that we don't even know. So I'm right. really honored to be with the two of you, Joanne, who I've known for probably more years than I will share because she might acknowledge. I said, "Oh, we I met when we were there. thirteen, right?" <laughs> We've known each other fifty years. Don't tell them that. No. When so, you're fe when mm. you're fetuses, <laughs> you're yeah. fetuses. We knew each other from. I've heard oh, so many I great. Friends. I've heard so many great things about you, Arlene. I've uh. <laughs> I've looked forward to meeting you in person, and here we are. But I think this has been a wonderful, wonderful yeah. experience for me. Thank you. Well, listen, we enjoyed that. This is just. Oh my gosh! I don't want to come back. Because yes, mm -hmm. we're having yeah. so much. Fun. Yeah. All right. Anyways, I would like to, of course, thank Larry, but thank everyone for watching, listening. Please share, please subscribe down below, make comments. Uh, we're on all different platforms that our angel Victor has us on out there, which, you know, Spotify, Apple, everything, you know, share it to expand this out so we could grow. And from our hearts to yours, always in total peace and in balance. If we right. have that, we have it all. And yeah. And whatever you do, just make it yeah. make it count. Maybe I'll comment also in conclusion. I also do a podcast with one of the other hypnotists in my office, Craig Pesic, and it's called hypnoticrhythmspodcast.com. And all we talk about is the mind and hypnosis and how it works. So this one's a little different because we're speaking about consciousness, the angels, spirituality, and uh it's a great podcast also of us just talking about how we'll have everything. We'll have all of Larry's information posted below. So connect. Thank we you. need to connect with all of this. It's all good. It's this is what we need in this world. <laughs> Rather than listen to the caca. Love is the way. It's Love is the way. channel. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you again, Larry. Mate. With we pleasure. Love you. Oh, we thank love you. you. Bye. Wow. Bye bye.